All right, guys. Hey, my name is Kevin. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us in our latest Novich Best of the Best webinar series brought to you by, of course, Novich, the design software superstore. My name is Kevin, and I am this week's latest and greatest uh, host. Um, Autodesk has incorporated a uh, technical consultant. Oops. Matthew Hawinski has been involved with 3D modeling, rendering, and animation for over 20 years. Uh, with a start in mechanical visualization over the past decade, Matthew has expanded his 3D experience to include architecture, interior, product, exhibit, and media design. For today's Novage webinar episode 55, Matthew will give us a comprehensive overview of Form Z7's significant new features. Topics included in today's discussion will be the new smart interface, sculpting tools, NURBS tools, and layout features. Expect to learn a bunch of new and nifty ways to get the job done in no time flat. The presentation itself will be about 40 minutes long, and in just a bit, I will hand over the podium to Matthew. If you have any questions at any time during the presentation, please post them into the chat window to get the job done um, so that we can answer them during the Q&A session. My bad. Well, today's webinar will be recorded live, so if you want to rewatch episode 55 in its entirety, as always, you can find it on our Novich webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. With that said, I will now turn it over to Matt. Matthew, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, here we go. I will change presenter now. Okay, hopefully everyone can uh, see my screen. We're excited to get started here today. Um, the presentation today, as Kevin said, uh, we're going to highlight many of the new tools and features that are available in the new Form Z7. Now, before we get started, I would just like to thank Frank and Vince and Kevin and all the wonderful people there at Novedge for hosting us and giving us this opportunity to showcase our new release of Form Z. So with that, uh, let's see what is new in Form Z7. Uh, well, Forms now includes the concept of workspaces. So just click the desired workspace icon, and the entire interface is adjusted with just the tools that you need for any particular task, such as modeling, drafting, layout, rendering, animation, uh, and you can customize these workspaces any way that you want. We'll take a real brief look at that today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by giving you a quick little introductory slideshow just to show you a few of these features that we're going to cover, and I'm going to jump right in and show you Forms live here in just a moment. Uh, the other thing that we're going to be looking at is the uh, new favorites panel. Uh, there's, uh, you just hit the space bar, and all your favorite customized tools are available right at the current cursor location. Uh, when the panel's active, you can also a um, access any tool uh, by hitting a key that corresponds to the name of a tool, which results in a list of all available tools with that letter. Uh, and I'll show you how that works in just a moment, too. Now, the new Form Z7 has a new fluid, powerful, and smart interface, which is optimized through automatic guides and intelligent snapping. Uh, these automatic drawing features drastically simplify and speed up the modeling process, and you'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment. Now, there's also all sorts of new reshaping tools in Form Z7, uh, which lets you easily sculpt your objects. Uh, and I would like to stress that this is done with real-time Boolean operations, resulting in good, clean, solid geometry that can be used further down the production pipeline. Um, dynamic and numeric input has also been enhanced to offer easier and more direct access to all the control parameters for your objects. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, even the deformation tools have been updated to the new interface, uh, allowing you to directly manipulate your objects uh, in the modeling window with real-time visual feedback. And all the NURBS tools have been updated, and there's also many brand new NURBS tools. Uh, this makes creating complex forms easier and more intuitive than ever before. Uh, I don't have time to cover a lot of NURBS stuff, but uh, actually I got quite a few things I'm going to show. Of course, I can't show them all, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll get a good representative sample of some of these NURBS capabilities um, today. Now, you can also build interesting shapes with the new NURBS by Formula tool which lets you explore shapes through mathematical equations and parameters, or just choose a shape from the pre-existing library and begin manipulating the parameters to create a new form. Um, and you're not limited to just nerves to create organic shapes. Uh, Forms he offers many other smooth modeling tools, such as lofting and guides and multi-branch lofting. So we'll look at a variety of other ways that we can you know, create complex stuff uh, with not just nerves tools. Now, there's also many new object attributes 
um, that can be assigned to your objects, such as the hatch patterns, uh, live uh, vector-based hatch patterns. So when you cut live cross sections through your model, uh, you can have hatch patterns there. Um, there's new faceting schemes, uh, which ultimately control the conversion of your smooth shapes into faceted objects. Uh, and I'll show you that real quick too. Um, the new surface analysis tools, which help you analyze the smooth aesthetic appearance of your design with a real-time visual evaluation uh, of your surfaces. Okay. Now I should mention that all the documentation is now online. So I'll simply right-click on any tool, choose the manual option, and that'll take you right to that page. Of course, you can just go to our website and access all of the manuals and videos there too. Uh, the videos. Uh, we've also added numerous online video tutorials uh, which show you step by step how to use a particular tool or feature. Uh, just simply right click any tool uh, and choose the video option and that'll take you to a link for, for that video. Now these links contain hours of free video tutorials. I think there's over five hours of, you know, if you watch them all back to back, uh, it's still over five hours right now. And we're still adding more because we don't have one for all the tools yet. Okay. Now, it should be noted that in Form Z, you can always be assured of good, clean, worry-free, industry-standard 3D models that can be used in any other application for construction drawings, fabrication, rapid prototyping, CNC machining, whatever you need that's geometry for, uh, you'll be assured that you'll be able to export that out and send it to any other program. Now, speaking of construction drawings, uh, Form Z now offers a new layout workspace. Now, this new feature lets you create a design layout with a series of sheets. Uh, of your project by linking any number of 3D models and images to your layout sheets. And if you change your 3D model, uh, your layout will automatically update. So it's sort of like a cross between InDesign and a drafting document. You, know, you can lay frames in there and put your images in there and, or cross sections of your model, things like that. Okay. Now, there's many new tools and features in Form Z7. However, since I'm very excited about getting started here, uh, let's go ahead and launch Form Z and get started with our live presentation. Uh, now, we'll use a couple of simple projects here uh, to put these new features into a uh, project-based context. Uh, one is this interior design space, uh, and the other is this metro rail project. Now, both of these projects were modeled, rendered, and animated completely in Form Z7. Uh, and so let's begin with our interior design space first, and this allows us the opportunity to uh, show you Form Z live here. So here we go. Let's go ahead and launch it. Uh, what I like to do before we start the interior design space that I created, uh, I started with a massing model first. Before I start building anything, give me about a minute or two. I just want to quickly show you a lot of the new things with a new interface of Form Z7. Uh, what you do is you move your cursor uh, over any of the uh, modeling tools over here. And you notice that the uh, suites of icons automatically fly out, so you don't have to click on anything. So you can quickly have access to all the different palettes that are there. Uh, you can take those palettes and move them around if you want. Customize that anyway that you want. Um, speaking of customization, you can go to the Tool Manager, and that's going to give you uh, ways to customize your screen. Let's look at the top half first. Uh, this lets you drag and drop icons anywhere. Uh, so I can actually create a brand new to tool palette by clicking on that. You can see it gets added to the scene there. And of course, all the tools are listed here, so I can just go through the, the different uh, database of all the tools right inside of the Tool Manager window. Or we can also just drag and drop them anywhere in our modeling window. So I can take these tools and move them around, drag them into any other palette that I want, and put some dividers in there. And so you can see how easy it is uh, to go ahead and graphically uh, modify and customize your tools any way that you want. Now the second half of this tool manager is your favorites panel. Uh, what this is, you hit the space bar and this little favorites heads up type display pops up right at your cursor. Customize that any way you want, move those icons around. Uh, and so to sort of show you how that works, I customize that myself there. So now whenever I hit the space bar, I get just the tools that I, that, that I want. All right, um, now you should notice that uh, when that favorites panel is open, I can also hit the letter of any key. So let's say I hit R. So it shows me all the tools that start with the letter R. So it gives me quick access to tools if I may not know where they are. So you can see I can click on a tool there. And whenever I click a tool in the favorites panel, uh, you can see it's going to highlight red. Now, I'm going to go pretty fast in this presentation as I'm modeling here. Uh, and I'm going to use the favorites panel a, a lot. And if you're ever wondering where, where that tool is, just look in the modeling tools over here, and it'll be highlighted red. So there'll be a red box around it. So you can sort of see where it's at inside of the modeling tools over there. Okay. Now, um, the other way to customize your 
a screen is through the workspaces. Now these are already set up. These are at default. So I didn't really customize the workspaces here. Uh, so right out of the box, we get the modeling workspace in the upper right hand corner here. And you can see these are primarily all the modeling tools. If I click on the drafting workspace icon, there are the, uh, two options there on the right. I get just primarily the tools that are used for drafting. It's not a different work environment. What it is is just a different set of tools. So it modifies just the interface. You're in the same project here, but now I have a different set of tools. I have all sorts of dimensioning tools and hatching tools and things like that. If I click the rendering and animation workspace, then I think you guessed it, you get all the tools associated with rendering and animating your project. So there's a, a new lights palette, we'll look at that. Uh, here's the animation tools, texturing, things like that, you know, animation timeline, so on and so forth. Now if you're coming from Bonsai, Bonsai 3D is a lighter version of FormZ. Uh, it doesn't have all the tools that FormZ has, uh, but uh, FormZ and Bonsai have the same type of interface uh, in FormZ 7. And uh, all the functionality that's in Bonsai is also in FormZ 7, but FormZ 7 is our flagship premium modeler. It has all the tools and all the features. Bonsai 3D is like a light version of FormZ. Now also notice when I go back to the modeling workspace, when I click on that, you'll see it comes back exactly the way it was when we left it. So it'll actually remember that for you when you quit and relaunch the program. And of course you can customize, create your own workspaces and things like that. Okay. And the last thing I want to show is that, uh, as I said in the very beginning, right click any tool and you can choose a manual or video option. That takes right to the page and that shows you a quick video of how to use that tool. Okay. All right, enough of that interface stuff. Let's go ahead and start doing some modeling here. Um, what I did with this project, with this in, uh, interior um, design space, uh, I actually started off by um, doing just a normal massing model. So let's see how quickly we can conceptualize uh, you know, a fast massing model inside of Form C7. Now I start with my drawing tools. So I can you know, pick any of the drawing tools here, I draw the shape that I want. I'm not too concerned about the size of the thing because as soon as I create anything uh, in Form C7, it automatically shows me the controls for the object. Now each object will have a different set of controls based on what that object is. Now this is just a simple cuboid, so you have length with height, and that's about it. But you know, more complex objects will have more control parameters based on what that shape is. Now notice I can do this dynamically in the modeling window, or in the right hand side in the tool options, I can always type in numbers at any time. So you get the both the best of both worlds by either dynamically or numerically modifying your shapes. How do you get rid of the controls? Well hit the escape hit the escape key or just start doing some other tool and the controls are automatically gone. Uh, if you want to bring those back, just simply right click on the object uh, with the pick tool active and you can turn the show controls on. Right click again and turn the show controls off. So you always have access to your control parameters at any time. Now let's create some more objects and notice that as I move that cursor over the existing objects in the scene, my drawing grid automatically moves onto the face of those existing objects. So it's a real quick, easy way to be able to uh, create geometry and obj objects anywhere in 3D space off of my existing uh, forms that are already there. Okay, unlimited undo, so I can undo back if I want. Um, now, another new thing in Form Z7 as compared to Form Z6 uh, would be in the drawing tools, there's this insert option. So look at the tool options here on the right. Uh, the drawing tools, uh, here's, whenever I click a tool on the left here, all the parameters for the tool are located in the tool options palette. Okay, so if I'm making stairs, you can see you know, there's all the parameters for those stairs. If I'm uh, just drawing a shape, you can see I can extrude it and you know, set my parameters. The thing I want to show here is the insert option. Uh, well, if that insert option is on for any of the drawing tools, if I happen to be drawing on the face of an existing object, uh, you'll see that that shape will actually insert itself into that object. So now I can move that shape inward to subtract volume or move it out to add volume. And of course, you can type in numbers at any time. Okay, so that's another way of sculpting your object to add and subtract volume. Now, a set of tools that I use constantly for sculpting objects is these tools right here. These are the reshape tools. These are my four favorite tools right here. That's where I get the majority of my work done. Um, reshape, offset outline, offset segment. Uh, I have all those set up in my little favorites panel here, so I'll be using them here. Uh, let's look at the offset segment. Uh, what I can do is click on any edge of an object, and I just offset that edge. I can at, at any time, you know, I can always type in numbers, but I'm just going to sort of eyeball that a little bit. And the insert option in the tool options is, is on by default, so if I offset it on the face of an object, it's going to insert that into the object. So now if I switch over to the other reshaping tool, which is the reshape tool itself, uh, that lets me pick any face of any object, and it reshapes it. So I can reshape it in, or I can reshape it out. So you can see uh, I can push that through to subtract that whole part of the object, to reshape it out, or to add additional volume. Now the thing to keep in mind here is very important. When I reshape objects, it's real-time Boolean function. So you're always going to have good, clean 
a solid geometry, or you can even reshape surfaces too. Uh, you'll have a good clean object. You won't end up with a coincident or mixed a topology type objects and things like that. Okay, so um, so with that, we've added and subtracted some polygons to sort of sculpt the massing of our interior space. Uh, what else do we need to do? Well, we haven't shown the offset outline tool. Let's take a look at that one. Here's one of the other four reshaping tools. Just click on any face or any boundary, and that's going to allow us to create an offset outline. Now, if I move that inward, uh, the insert option is on by default for that tool. I can turn it off if I want. It's on, so it's going to insert it if, if it's inside the face of that boundary. So now I can use the reshape tool, uh, select that inside face, and now you can see I can reshape that up to add volume. Or if I reshape it in just a little bit, I can create a parapet for the building, or even reshape it all the way through, real-time Booleans. There's no problem. I'm pushing that as far through the object as I want. You can go through non-planar boundaries. So you can go through multiple boundaries to the object. Uh, it's real-time Boolean functions that are going on there. Okay, and I just constantly use the reshape tool because you know I'm always uh, adjusting my geometry and sort of tweaking it and modifying my design. And that reshape tool is just a invaluable tool to be able to just quickly you know move things around a little bit and be assured that you're still going to have good clean geometry. All right, um, this is sort of boxy looking. Let's get a little curvature in there. So what we'll do is uh, maybe select the spline drawing tool. Now, there's actually many different spline drawing tools. I, that's the one I use the most, but you can see there's many other drawing functions here that we can choose from. And notice I'm going to change my options here. I'm going to make it a 3D wall. And of course, I can set it in my parameters for the thickness of the wall and things like that if, if I want. And just sort of uh, snap to the end point here, click a few points. And then if I uh, double click on the end over here, extrude that out. And they snap to the end. So the automatic snapping is let me make sure things are lined up just right, and it's all set up down here. Uh, and we got the result buffer mode, just like I said at the very beginning. As soon as I create something, you know, I automatically have those controls visible to go back in right away and start adjusting it and tweaking it uh, to fine tune that that I'm design. All right. Now let's look at some other ways that we can create some curved uh, type of forms here. Uh, actually, instead of just drawing a wall, I'm going to use some of these tools here. Actually, these are tools that we're going to use a lot today. Uh, when we get into the Metro Rail Station, we're going to be using a lot of these too. Um, the thing I'm going to do here is a loft, and we're actually going to cover some more of this stuff. Now, these are not NURBS tools. Actually, there's a full set of NURBS tools down here. Uh, we're going to cover that too. Uh, so we can create NURBS using a variety of tools. We can edit NURBS by blending, attaching, merging, and uh, we'll definitely cover that in just a moment here. But now, here's a bunch of other smooth organic modeling tools that aren't NURBS. It's just generating you know, smooth 3D forms. Uh, one of them is a tangent loft. And you just click on two things, two faces, two segments, whatever you want. Uh, and it'll loft a surface between those two things that you clicked on. All right, and so there, nice lofted surface. You're saying, well, I want to smooth it out a little bit. Well, there's a tangent option for the start or end. Notice if in the two options here, if I click the switch tangent face, you can see since I clicked on an edge, I can actually switch uh, which face of that edge that that uh, lofted surface is tangent to. We can make it tangent at the end. Click on the switch tangent face for that. To make it tangent to either one of those faces. Okay, and that's how we can maintain not just smooth shapes, but also making sure they attach to the existing form, and you have a smooth tangent transition that flows uh, when you're combining multiple pieces together. All right, now because we clicked on two edges, that is a paper thin surface. We could have clicked on two faces to make it a solid, uh, but in this case, we can just use our thicken tool to thicken any surface object. It's great for 3D printing if you want to print something; it has to be solid. Or sometimes it's easier to work with a surface object than just use your thicken tool uh, to take that surface and thicken it. And once again, it's in the orange result buffer mode, meaning uh, as soon as I apply that tool, I can go and start changing my parameters here in tool options and quickly adjust that uh, to fine tune. Uh, the different parameters of that current operation. Okay, so there we got the walls lined up just right. Now these are separate objects. Of course, uh, since Forms is a solid modeler, we still have all the traditional Boolean tools, real Boolean tools, uh, so we can union, add, and subtract uh, different solid objects together. Uh, I have them my favorites here, so I can just click on the two solid walls, and of course, boom, that's all fused together to make one good, clean, solid wall. You know, 3D print without any problem at all. All right. Um, enough of that. That's a good introduction to some of the basic uh, drawing tools, to creating some basic shapes, the control parameters, and things like that. Um, let's try to get a little more into the organic stuff. Maybe what we'll do is look at uh, some different ways that I conceptualize uh, this uh, 
sort of sculpted ceiling here. We have a nice flowing curvature uh, to these beams. These beams are flat on top, but the bottom is curved, and we have the spacing through there. And you know, how can we uh, conceptualize and you know, sort of play with you know these complex 3D forms that is derived through a series of concentric beams like this? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to fast forward through the process that I went through with this. Um, I first created a 3D form itself to create so that the overall flow of those beams. And I did that using nerves. Uh, many ways of making nerves. Here's just one way of doing that. I'm going to just start off with a simple shape and then convert it into a nerves object. So what I'll do is I want to draw a 2D rectangle on top of the wall. If I move my cursor on top, I can tap the F5 key. When I tap that F5 key, you can see that now it locks at my current drawing grid right at the current position of where it, it's at. So now I can just sort of draw a 2D rectangle anywhere. I don't have to be actually snapping on a piece of geometry because I have that plane locked in there. I have a nice little 2D, 2D plane. So then if I tap F5 again, now the drawing grid is free to move anywhere that I want. And that's with the F5 key to lock and unlock the drawing grid. Now, as a 2D rectangle, what control parameters do we have? We have length and width, and that's it. Okay, looking tool options over there. You know, that's the only things I can change. I want to make a very convex, concave, curvy type shape. So I want to convert this to nerves. Uh, now, I'm going to quickly access a lot of tools in my uh, favorites panel here, but all the nerve tools are located right here for creating and editing nerves. Um, so I'm going to first use the convert to nerves tool. What this does is converts anything into a nerves object. So now if I were to uh, right click on that surface and show controls, now we don't have length and width. We have these control points that can move anywhere and stretch that thing into any crazy shape. Okay. What if I want to add more controls on there? Well, there's a nerves reconstruct tool. And as I'm clicking tools here, you can see it's highlighted right over here. Um, I click on the object, and in the tool options, I can go in and start typing in some numbers to tell it how many controls uh, I want on that surface object. Okay? Then I can just use the Move tool to start grabbing these controls and move those around. Uh, I can uh, tap and release the Command key on Mac or the Control key on Windows to toggle between the parallel or perpendicular direction of the current position of whatever I'm currently moving. So it could be moving a box or moving a, a control point, a parameter of an object. Just tap and release the command can Mac or control can Windows. That will go parallel or perpendicular. Okay. Now, as I was sculpting the ceiling, actually what I did was I actually uh, was inside that space. You know, I want to be standing there. Um, I'm about six foot two, but I put in about five foot nine for the average person to sort of see what they would see if they were inside that space. And of course, just start walking around here. Uh, there's a wonderful tool to be able to navigate within this 3D space here. And it's called the walkthrough tool. And before I show that, let me just fast forward here. This is the actual surface that I ended up with sculpting. Uh, and the walkthrough tool, that's up here, the navigational tools up here at the top. Um, and you can see uh, there's these little footprints here. Uh, and this is sort of like a video game where you can just sort of use your mouse to go forwards and backwards. You can tilt your head to the left, right, look up and down. You know, you hold a couple of keys to sort of, you know, as if you're virtually walking through that space. There's a collision avoidance system, so you can't walk through walls and things like that. Uh, now, if you want, you can turn the avoid collision off. Uh, which gives you super superhuman abilities to walk through solid objects if you want. But anyway, you know, this is a good way to sort of travel around, move the controls, edit, and design right inside of that 3D space. Okay. So, anyways, to sort of fast forward here, um, I ended up with a NURB surface that looked like this. All right. And the goal was I wanted the NURB surface to fit inside the boundaries of my interior space of that room. Uh, and so, what I can do is go to the Modify tools, which is along with the Boolean tools here, because Booleans work with solids. And but what if you have surface objects? This form sees a solid and a surface modeler. Well, there's also some other surface splitting and slicing tools that can be used. Uh, to it can be used in any type of geometries: solid surfaces, mixture of solid and surface objects, whatever you got. So you can use the surface split. Uh, I can pick the surface and split it with my solid wall. So now it'll actually use the walls as sort of like a cookie cutter and cut right through my uh, nerve surface like a piece of dough. All right, I will um, delete the parts that I don't want. So I don't want the outside part. I don't want the part that's intersecting through the thickness of the wall. I'm going to keep just that inside portion. Uh, now, consistent with previous versions of Form Z, it's ghosting the original operands of your operations. Uh, so you can use the unghost tool to bring back those original objects. Okay, and with that, we can give it a little transparency here to see through that. And there we go. So there's a nice little uh, overall curvature of the ceiling. All right, and then. The next step I need to do is give this some sort of thickness. I could use the Thicken tool, uh, or I can actually use the derivative tools. I'll use the derivative extrude tool, which is uh, in most cases used to extrude a 2D shape into a 
solid object. So if you bring in a 2D plan, like an AutoCAD plan, you would use a derivative tool to pull it up into 3D solid wall. Or in this case, I can take this complex shape and pull and pull that up. Okay, and we end up with a surface that would look like that. I draw a line, uh, and in the front view, I can take that solid object and using the slice tool, which is right here, pick the object, pick that line, and it slices that into two pieces, and then I can delete the top half and get rid of that line. And the end result is we end up with this you know, solid ceiling that looks like that. Now our goal here, I'm going to fast forward through a couple things here through the presentation because I got a lot to cover. Uh, so there's a couple things that I'm going to have to fast forward through just to um, make sure that I can fit everything in that I want to fit in today. So we end up with a solid object that we have here. And what I want to do is cut a number of cross sections through that. And a great tool to use that uh, to do that is the uh, contour cut tool. And what it does is it cuts a number of contours through there. So what I'm going to do is just click on the object. Now in Form Z6, it had the contour tool. That's not a new tool in Form Z7. What is new is the new interface of how it works. Uh, and so I can just click on the object, and I start adjusting my parameters for that. Okay. Um, actually, let's give that a solid color here and undo a step back. Select the contour cut tool, click on the object. It gives us a series of contour cuts. Now at this point, uh, it's cutting it in a vertical direction. And that's not the direction I want it to go. In Form Z6, I would have to stop, undo, change my parameters, and do another contour cut. If I didn't get the results I want, undo, change the parameters, and do it again. In 7, you don't have to do that. I can now start editing this thing live in the result buffer mode, just like all the other tools. So let's say I want those contour cuts to go in a different direction. Well, I'll just take this little widget. I can rotate it 90 degrees forward. And now it's cutting all the contours in that direction. See, let's have them go the other direction. So I can maybe grab this ring, rotate that, maybe a little bit that way, and there. Now they're all being cut in the opposite direction. If I want to control the start position of the cuts, I can move this anywhere that I want, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, we can even take this one step further. Here's some additional new stuff that's been added to the tool in Form Z7. We can actually choose some of these different layout options. Uh, let's say we're ready to actually build uh, these different beams here. So I can actually lay them all flat on the XY plane. And you can see that this is a true spline-based data. So if you were to export this out to a CNC machine, uh, it would understand the spline-based data that is there. And you can actually cut these sections out of you know, whatever your material is. Okay. Now let's not get ahead of ourselves here. We're not ready to build this thing yet. It's still in the conceptual stages of the design. So let's go ahead and uh, maybe put that back uh, and leave it at the current elevation uh, until at a later date when we're ready to actually build this thing. Okay. Um, so anyways, that gives you some idea of how we were to cut those cross sections. Uh, if we do want to thicken those, of course, it is cutting a 2D cross section. We can use our thicken tool. We can pick all the objects in one single thicken operation and thicken all those. Um, let's create a floor slab. Now that we've got this you know, shape here, we need the floor to match that perimeter. Uh, once again, we'll go to our derivative tools. We want to derive objects off of our existing objects. Uh, and so there's a whole, actually a whole set of derivative tools here. And we're going to look at a couple here. So you know, this lets us build off of our existing uh, geometry that we have. So what I'm going to do is with the uh, 2D surface object, I can just click anything, it's going to create a new object for me. Now if it doesn't highlight the part that you want, just leave the cursor there, start hitting the tab key. As I hit the tab key, it's going to start parading through all the other possible options. So there's a face, there's an outline, and once it gets, ah, there's the outline I want, I click and the tool is applied to whatever is highlighted at that time. So the tab key is a little neat little trick to be able to Know, get to the different topological parts of objects. All right, we'll drop that on there, and there's our floor slab. So we can use the extrude tool or the reshape tool and simply uh, take that 2D surface and reshape it into a thick, solid slab. All right, so let's go back and unghost that original wall that we had there. And there, uh, hopefully in you know those few minutes there, you get a pretty good idea of how we can sort of conceptualize uh, our 3D interior space. Um, let's just look at a couple more things briefly here. Uh, what we're going to do, is maybe look at you know how we sort of conceptualize this you know crazy uh, carpeting here with all these little uh, curved uh, patterns to that. Uh, well, what I did with that was I went in and just drew a bunch of splines, okay. And then using the fourth tool in the reshaping suite that I didn't show you didn't show you yet, uh, that's the imprint tool. And what you do is you click on a spline curve, you click on an object, and it imprints that shape into the face of the object. So you can see here it's not like the slice tool. The slice tool is cutting all the way through. It's going to actually break that into two pieces. The actual imprint tool is just imprinting it. Okay, so if we want to get uh, all these splines on there, we can actually select all those, select our imprint tool, click on the object, 
and it'll imprint all of those. So now we've actually split that top face. It's still one single solid slab, but now we have multiple faces that's defining that top. Which leads us to the next area that I want to cover is let's get into the rendering, uh, the new rendering features in Form Z7. Uh, and so the best way to do that is let's show you how to make a material first. Uh, actually, it's sort of similar to how it was in previous versions. Uh, you just double click the material, it brings up the material parameters. Um, and Notice that uh, we also have the render zone material type. If you're using render zone for your actual renderings, if you're using Maxwell, whatever, uh, any other plugin renders, uh, we'll then have those other options there. Um, we also have all of our predefined materials listed right inside of the material parameter. So that's something that is new. So you don't have to search to any external dialogs to be able to get to um, existing material libraries. They're already attached to your material parameters. And they're organized in categories. We've updated all these materials. Uh, and of course, you can create your own libraries if you want also. So uh, let's go to carpeting. And if you see one that we like, just simply take that predefined material, drag and drop it onto your material. Now your material parameters are all updated to those preset parameters. All right, how do we get it onto the object? Well, now in Form Z7, it's drag and drop. So just simply drag it right onto the object. And that material is applied to all the faces of the object. But if you want to apply it to just parts of the object, for example, I have some other types of carpeting here that I already created. I'm going to drag it onto different faces here. So I hold down the Command key on Mac or the Control key on Windows. And that's going to let me drag and drop my material onto just a single face of that object. And there we go. And that's how easy it is now in Form Z7. All right. Um, with that, uh, let's fast forward once again. Uh, let's go ahead and turn our walls on. We could earlier, we've already applied some wallpaper to those. I just want to quickly show you how easy we can edit the size and texture now in Form Z7. Um, actually, since we're in, rendering, uh, we're in the rendering portion here, let's go to the rendering workspace. We're no longer modeling, right? So let's go ahead and click on the rendering workspace icon. And now we're getting just the tools that are used for the rendering and animation of our project. Because the tool I need here is the edit texture. Okay? Now if I click on any object, you can see I can edit the size and scale of that texture. Uh, live you know, right there inside the modeling window, so I don't have to go into uh, any other texture editing dialog or anything. Okay? Now also notice that as I'm changing the overall scale of that, either horizontally or vertically, um, it's adjusting all the faces of that same object because they're all grouped together as a single texture group. What if I want to separate that out? Well, uh, what you can do is use the Map Texture tool, and what's the key you hold down to get to topological levels? Yep, it's the Command key on Mac or Control key on Windows. So now I can texture map and retext map just one face of the object. So now by clicking on that with the Map Texture tool, you can see now if I were to edit the scale or size, it's affecting just that one face. Okay. So for example, let's say I have this nice stone material on there. You can see I can change the size and scale of that stone pattern on just that face. Or you can actually group multiple faces together. You can use the Map Texture tool and click on multiple faces and group those together. So that's a real quick, easy way to directly create texture groups right in the modeling window uh, with just a couple clicks and, uh, and you're on your way. Okay. All right, uh, next I want to briefly talk about lighting. Um, some of the new things that uh, have been added in Form Z7 for being able to quickly add lighting and visualize your lighting in the scene. Um, here we just happen to have some light fixtures uh, that I've already created. Okay, and they're there, right there. And I tell you what, before I do that though, tell you what, let's go back for a second. Uh, let's go and see how the lights work first before I place those in here. Here's the new light palette. Here we go. Um, and how do you add those to the scene? Well, just pick a light. How about a distant light, which is like the sun? I click and place it in the scene. Done. Okay. If I want to move it around, you know, I can use the move tool or whatever and drag that light source around, it's in the result buffer mode, just like any other operation in the, in the program, you know, you're in this orange result buffer mode to immediately change any parameters of whatever you just did. Now you're, you're probably looking at this thing, hey, wait a second, I'm changing the direction of the sun, but I don't see any changes in the rendering in my scene. Uh, and that's because we're in shaded full mode. Now here's all the display modes up on top, here's wireframe, rendering mode, so on and so forth. The two main uh, working modes is the shaded work and shaded full. Now wireframes are working mode too, of course, obviously, so we can see the actual wireframe information that's there. Shaded full doesn't use any lights. What it does is it just sort of fully lights your scene. It doesn't look at your lights palette. It doesn't care what type of lights you have placed in your scene. It's just going to fully light everything in your scene. So that's really nice when you're first creating your forms because everything is fully lit. But now that I want to see the effects of those light sources, I then switch to the next mode up here in the top and the right there. I'm going to go to Shaded Full. Shaded Full means it's going to be a live, interactive 
rendering mode that I can work in and create objects, but it's going to use the actual light sources. So now I can see if I were to move that light source, now we're getting live interactive shadows, specular hotspots, and everything uh, based on the position of the actual lights in that scene. Okay, now since I do have a sunlight there, this is a great opportunity to show you another new feature in 7, uh, which is the new sun position palette. Now, the sun position from a database is not new in Form Z. We've had that for ages, for as long as I can remember. Uh, but what is new is that it's a lot easier to do now. Now it's in, in, it's in its own palette. Uh, whereas in previous versions, you had to go into the light, go into light parameters, go into this dialog, which took you into a database, which then you start setting your parameters and there's this multi-tiered effect. Now, boom, one-stop shop for your sun positioning needs uh, right here in the sun position palette. Um, it's automatically animated for you. You can slide the time of day back and forth. Uh, you can choose any day of the year. Um, you can choose any city in any part of the world. Um, it's, aut it's automatically animated for you. Just click the, cl uh, click the play button and off it goes. And you can also take that animation and you can automatically export it. So there's export options there. Uh, so that's just some new enhancements to the existing uh, sun positioning uh, that's available uh, in Form Z7. Now, it just so happens that this interior space is not um, well, it's an actual interior space. There's no windows. There's no sunlight coming into the space. This is a smaller area inside of a larger building, inside of a larger project. Uh, so we don't need any sunlight. There's no sunlight getting into the space. So we're going to have to add some other types of light. So that's where we're going to go into these other light fixtures that I have already created that I showed you earlier. And what we're going to do is quickly place some lights in here. And so I don't have lights in there yet. I have the geometry for it. You know, I have the lamp shades and everything, the sconces and that. Uh, but there's no actual light source that's emitting any light. So we need to add those using the new lights palette up here. So to see the real-time preview of these light effects, let's go to shaded full mode. So there, now it's actually in the interactive mode. Uh, and it's going to give me the effect of the actual light sources. Let's choose a point light. Click the point light, drag it through my scene. I can actually snap it maybe to the end point over here. And there it is. I can change the parameters and tool options or I can change parameters right through the modeling window, just like any other operation uh, in Form C7. Let's take a little cone light. Maybe we'll add one uh, to one of our light fixtures back there. Once again, let's go ahead and start uh, modifying some of the parameters here. Maybe grab this and pull it up just a little bit. Modify the inner and outer angle of that thing. All right, pull those around and change it. Pretty much do anything you want. And we're getting you know sort of a preview of the lighting condition in that scene. Let's add another cone light over here. And another one over there, so on and so forth. So I think you get the idea of uh, how much quicker and easier, and, and with more visual feedback, uh, you'll be able to set up your lighting uh, in Form Z7. All right. Now, let's just look at a couple more things real quick here. Uh, what I want to do is show one other neat new modeling tool uh, for the Lounge project, and then we'll switch over to the Metro project. I have a couple neat little nerves things I want to show with that. Um, the one thing I want to show with this is that uh, what was helpful uh, if you look at that rendered image, there are some plants here. Of course, there's you know a hundred different ways you can put plants in your scene, uh, but here's just a neat little way that uh, I did that in this project was I used the new billboard tool. Here it is, billboard. And what you do with that is you load any type of image. So I went and found an image of a plant, and that's it. It automatically creates the polygon and creates the material and maps it onto the onto the polygon for you. All sorts of parameters we can adjust here to stand it perpendicular, align with view, give it a physical size, and there it is. So we can quickly uh, place those in our scene. All right? And you see it's currently aligned with that view because I turned that option on. All right? So no matter where my view angle is, my animation, whatever, you know, I always have that 2D plant always looking at the camera angle. Um, now just to sort of show you, if I go down here in my materials, it automatically created that material for me. So if I want to make any adjustments to that, like maybe use some kind of alpha channeling, to clip out the background, or you can use a grayscale image and just use the color intensity values uh, to clip out the background uh, if you want also. Actually, we need to load that same image for that. There we go. Use that alpha channel. That'll probably work a little better for that plant. There we go. And so when we actually render it, we won't see that background image. Now, here's another neat way that this billboard tool comes in really handy. Uh, I use it to bring in un underlay sketches. I sketch something on a piece of paper, a napkin. I actually scan it into a pixel image, and I, I want to bring it into my 3D virtual modeling world, right? Because I want to trace over that sketch. Uh, now, there's other ways of doing that. Here's one way that I like to do it. Uh, let's go ahead and load that pixel image. All right? So here's a nice little sketch. All right? And then I'm going to place that in my scene. Now, if I know the exact size to bring it at the right scale, I can type that in now. But, you know, if it's just a sketch, maybe I don't have that data. So I'll just go ahead and place it in here. 
All right, so there's a nice little sketch. Now, of course, it's not to scale. So how do I get that to the proper scale? Well, here's another neat new thing in Form Z7. Uh, if I were to pick the object or multiple objects, I can use the measure tool. Uh, and the measure tool, what I'm going to do is just measure any two points anywhere. So let's go from right there to right about there. Now, it's telling me that's 1 foot 8 and 1 16th of an inch. Well, really, that room is going to be about 30 feet. So I just type in 30 feet. I click Update. And boom, whatever is currently highlighted or whatever currently I picked will all be scaled accordingly uh, to that actual distance. So there, now I have my sketch brought in the proper scale. Now I can start uh, tracing over that. Okay. All right. All right, with that, um, there's a couple things I want to show real quick uh, with this uh, Metro project. There's a couple of neat little nerves things that we did with that. Um, so let's go ahead and give that a try. Uh, what we did is we started, uh, when I was starting to conceptualize a nice contemporary station, uh, first thing I did was use the new components tool to place one of the standard component people in there. Of course, we have trees and furniture and um, you know, abstract people and things like that. But anyways, we have a person standing there to give some sort of perspective and scale to our project, and there he is waiting for the train to come, right? So let's create a nice little contemporary station to protect them from the elements. And let's see what we can come up with. Uh, I'm going to pretty much do the same thing I did with the previous project. You know, start off with a very uh, simple shape and then convert that to nerves and then start modifying it uh, to create a more complex form. So there we have a 2D shape. Uh, let's go ahead and convert that to nerves with the Convert to Nerves tool. Uh, we'll turn the show controls on and we'll use Reconstruct tool to add some additional control points on there. And we're ready to start moving this thing around, sculpting, and using our design creativity uh, to sort of modify that into some of the shape. Now, there's many other NURBS tools for creating uh, other types of NURBS shapes. There's NURBS by boundary curves, uh, NURBS by lofting, uh, NURBS by UV curves. Um, the list goes on and on. And unfortunately, in our time frame, I just can't show all the NURBS tools here. But anyways, uh, let's go ahead and just sort of sculpt some sort of shape here. Okay, so there's a nice little canopy for this. And some other new stuff I want to show with the nerves is the ability to insert a knot. And what the insert knot tool does is lets us insert control points anywhere that we want on the object. So we can set a row of controls either along the U, so look in the tool options over here, in the U or the V direction. And notice that as I get the definition of where that new control line is going to be added, notice that my shape does not change at all. Uh, this lets me insert controls and it adjusts the surrounding controls to make sure that whatever shape or form or design I have, it does not affect it at all. So it keeps that same shape. Now, of course, we don't also have the um, other method where you can insert controls and it actually flattens that part. So it can cause a distortion of your surface. So you can use both of those. Uh, both have their, uh, both of those methods have their advantages. Um, now, actually, another option in here. Let me show this. Uh, there's a kink option. So if I turn that on. So I can actually have that control line position as a kink in that surface. So to sort of show you that, if I were to move that new control line that I added in there, uh, you can see that now it forms a kink in there. So it's a light, sharp crease that we have in our surface. Now this is one single nerve surface, uh, but we have an uh, edge of discontinuity uh, right where the kink is uh, in the control points of that surface. So that's another way of you know, being able to work with these nerve surfaces to create just, a, just an infinite array of 3D forms. All right. Now in this case, I'm just going to undo a couple steps back, go back to this surface. And one other thing that I do when I'm creating complex uh, shapes is you know, I don't try and build it all in one shot. I do it as a network of patched NURB surfaces that I can attach and blend them together to create the one overall form. So let's go ahead and try that uh, with this one here. So what I'll do is make a copy of this surface, uh, move it over here a little bit, and then go to our NURBS blending tool. So I can click from the edge of this NURB surface to the edge of that one. Nice little blended surface there to fill in that little gap there. Um, we have all sorts of continuity settings here to control the tangency as it rolls off one surface to the other. In addition to that, we also have these neat little controls here. Uh, this is pretty cool. So now I can go in and actually tweak that blending process anywhere along that surface. So if I want to adjust a little bit over here, a little bit over there, you know, move those controls around anywhere that you want and fine tune that blending process. Okay. Now, you can also blend to a single line. I do this very often, too. Or it could be in the edge of some other object. So for example, if I had uh, maybe some kind of spline over here, or maybe that was the edge of some curved wall or something like that, uh, the, the, the blend tool can actually be used. Even though it's a NURBS tool, it can be used on non-NURBS objects. So you can see I can actually blend to some other uh, type of shape there. Okay. Now, in this case, uh, actually what I did with that station was I used the derivative tools and I derived the new edge of that object. And then I took that new edge, 
uh, and I move it over just a little bit like that. Uh, and of course, I use the unbuilt tool to bring back that original surface now. And now we have a nice little spline curve that matches that existing edge of my existing shape or my existing form. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, move that up just a little bit. And then I go in and turn those controls on. So with the pick tool, I right click and use the show controls option. And then just like, you know, maybe make a few adjustments here. And maybe drag this control over to stretch that out just a little bit. Tap and release the command can Mac or control can windows to move parallel or perpendicular. Okay. Now, um, once I have that spline curve position where I want, then I go in, I use the blend tool, I can blend from the nerve surface up to the spline curve over there, and then continue on and just keep you know, working as a network of patched nerve surfaces to sort of continue on uh, with the shape uh, of that design. All right. um, as I continued on here, I went ahead and take this surface and make a copy of it to fill in gaps. Uh, whenever I fill in gaps, actually there's a couple tools I use for that. One of them uh, is the nerves blend, of course, obviously. Uh, so I can actually just click on you know, maybe the edge of this surface here and the edge of that one. And you can see that it is giving me a nice tangency, but maybe that's not what I want. Uh, you know, maybe I want to sort of give it more of a sharp, hard edge here. Uh, I can't kink that right there because really that's the end of the surface. So I can't use the kink option uh, to put a nice crease there. So what I'll do is obviously change the continuity settings in the tool options here. So you can see uh, here's where it starts and here's where it ends. And we have all the industry standard uh, from G0 up to G4, different type of continuity settings to be able to control that tangency. If I set it to G0 positional, there's no tangency. It just goes straight uh, from the edge of the one thing that you pick on straight to the edge of the other one. So there we can get a nice little uh, sharp uh, kink or crease uh, to create a nice little scallop effect uh, for our station. And once I had that, you know, of course, uh, to sort of continue on, I can copy that a couple times to get that scalloped effect. And for the other side of that station, I wanted to maintain some kind of a symmetry. So I went ahead and used the mirror tool to mirror this half over to the other side. Now, I don't know where the center is um, because I could probably put some guidelines in there and find it. But in this case, I, I'm not really too concerned. I'm just sort of conceptualizing it. So as soon as I click, I click two points to mirror it. See these automatic guides show up for everything. When you're drawing shapes, uh, when you're transforming, whatever you're doing, these guides are always showing up to make sure that you can actually snap to those to be able to go in X, Y, or whatever orientation, tangent or perpendicular or whatever. Okay. All right. So now we got that mirrored over to the other side. Snap it over here. Let's fill in that gap. Instead of the blend tool, let's look at one more nerves tool here, and that's the uh, nerves attach. So that's sort of like blending, except what's going to happen when you attach it is going to take the edge of this nerves and stretch it, pull it until it matches with the edge of that surface over there. Okay? And if you ever get twisting, like what we see here, uh, no problem. Just select the reverse edge orientation option, because sometimes when you're going from one nerve surface to the other, the one, the normal, might be pointing the opposite direction, so it'll twist that nerve surface. We don't care about any of that. Just click the reverse edge option, and boom, it'll untwist the one end. All done. Okay, and once again, we have continuity settings with this too, so instead of tangential, we'll make it positional, so it goes straight to that edge to give it more of a sharp look to that. Okay. All right, um, another way of making um, or closing in areas would be, let's say uh, this is all glass right here, and we want to fill in this last little area here. Well, you know, how do I get some shape to sort of cap off the end there? Uh, well, there's a capping tool, which is right here, cap. And what we can do is just pick a whole bunch of edges. And when we pick those edges, uh, if it forms a closed boundary, it'll fill in that gap for us. So let's see how that works. You click the cap tool, just start clicking. And if it, if it recognizes a series of closed edges, it'll just fill it in for you. There it is, done. Now also notice there's some tangency options with that. We can increase the bulge, which is actually increasing uh, the actual tension on there. So you can see that we can actually uh, crank that slider up or down, and it is a nice tangent smooth surface. Uh, and as we increase or decrease that tension, it's going to sort of bulge in or out of that boundary. Now, of course, if we want this to be glass, uh, that looks sort of cool, bulged out like that. But let's go ahead and just make it a minimal surface. I choose that option now. It just keeps it flat. So plenty of ways of being able to work with organic shapes and filling in the different gaps and openings between those surfaces to create the network of the surfaces to create your overall form. All right. Um, with that, uh, there's just a couple more things I want to show here, uh, and then I'll be done. Um, I just want to quickly look at some of the, these different kiosks. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to use for these kiosks yet, so we're coming up with all sorts of different varieties of different types of designs here. And so uh, let's just look at uh, a couple tools that are real helpful in trying to conceptualize the different variations of these different kiosks here. All right. Uh, that's using these tools right here, all sorts of different lofting tools here. So what we're going to do with that 
is uh, start off with a series of um, shapes, so like this maybe. All right, and we're going to loft. So the first one is a ruled loft. What does that mean? Uh, that means if I click a bunch of sources and it lofts, it's going to go straight uh, through those sources directly. Okay, so you can see there's no smoothing. It just goes exactly the way those sources are created. Uh, sometimes you want that, some, sometimes you don't. Uh, if you don't want that, uh, you can go to the next tool, which is a tangent loft. It adds some, adds some tangency to that. So now I can pick a bunch of uh, sources, loft through those, and you get this nice smooth shape. And there's some parameters that we can adjust inside of the tool options. Now, in addition, uh, we can also do another variation of that, which is a guided loft. So what that lets us do is, which is this tool right here, it lets us loft through some sources, just like the previous loft, but we also have another set of curves, and these curves help guide that lofting process. You can have as many guides as you want, as many sources as you want. So with that, uh, we pick all of our sources first. I'm holding down the shift key to pick all of our sources. I let go of the shift key. I click a blank area. It doesn't do anything yet. Now I have to click a second set of objects. So now I hold the shift key, pick all my uh, guides, which are just curves. I draw them anywhere. Let go of the shift key, I click. So now it's doing a lofting and being guided by those guides at the same time. So we have more control over that overall form by being able to control the transition from one loft shape into the next. All right. There's also a branch loft. We can take this lofting process and have it branch out in multiple directions. Sort of like a tree. You have the trunk of the tree, and then all the branches are going off in different directions. Uh, let's take a quick look at that. So you can see here, uh, we're going to loft in two different two different directions here, so the number of branches is two. You can have as many branches as you want. So what you do is you hold on the shift key, pick all the sources that make up your trunk, let go of the shift key, and click a blank area. Now it's ready for the, the first branch. So then I start clicking all those, hold shift key to multi-pick, or if there's just one, you can just pick the one and that accepts that as the next branch. Okay, so let's click the other branch and off it goes. So now it's going to loft through the two sources for the trunk, and then that lofting is going to split in two different directions. And then, of course, we also have the other variation. I've actually tried this with four, just to sort of maybe put four kiosk and one terminal, I don't know, and all sorts of crazy ideas here. So um, anyways, uh, there is one last thing I want to show here. Uh, I, I mentioned at the very beginning about the um, uh, uh, surface analysis tools, because I, I, I do want to show that. Um, and what we can do is maybe look at the engine itself or one of the cars, and we're going to use our uh, lofting tool to quickly loft shape. And we want to analyze that shape. You know, we want to make sure we have a nice, smooth, aesthetic uh, surface that doesn't have any type of areas of discontinuity or any type of imperfections on that surface. Uh, and the best way to do that is to use the surface analysis tools. And that's an attribute that's assigned to the object. So I pick the object. I go into the attributes of that object. Um, and actually, um, we'll go into the analysis option. I can turn the analyze object on. And we have some choices here. Now, the, the default is the traditional zebra stripes. So with that, we can go in and um, we can choose some different options here if we want. But basically, um, all of you industrial designers know how that works, right? Uh, it's just a bunch of zero. It's just a bunch of zebra stripes that are um, in real time reflected on the surface. Uh, so you can look for any discontinuities or irregularities in the flow of those zebra stripes uh, to look for any imperfections that might exist. Uh, in that surface. Okay. Now, some of these other options that we have, uh, you can actually go in there uh, and turn on the the reflection option, which you can load any pixel image, and it has real-time reflections on the surface. There's draft angle, there's porcupine plots, you name it, all the industry standard ways that you can analyze that that surface to you know make sure you have a nice, good, clean, aesthetic surface there. Okay, when it reaches the real world. Okay. All right, um, with that, um, that was pretty much um, everything that I wanted to show today. Um, but before I let you go, let me just mention a couple things really quick here. I'd like to conclude by just highlighting just a few additional tools and features that we didn't have time to show today. So give me one, one more minute here uh, to sort of quickly go through a real fast slideshow to show you some of these other things here, uh, such as the new non-destructive dynamic clipping planes. You can dynamically move them through your model. You can have multiple planes turned on at the same time. And you can still model uh, inside of those clipped areas. Uh, there's also a new roof tool, which lets you easily create a roof by simply clicking on any boundary. Uh, and there's numerous parameters to control the details of that. Okay. Uh, stairs, now stairs aren't new. Uh, we've had that formsy for a long time. But uh, what is new is that we've added a new, a new switchback stair. 
uh, in addition to the existing stairs. And uh, with a new interface, the stairs are now, are now more dynamic. It allows you to easily manipulate the parameters of the stairs right there uh, inside the modeling window. We've also added a new Contour Doctor tool, which is added to our existing terrain tool, which we've had in there for a long time, uh, to assist you in finding and fixing any irregularities of contour lines. Uh, so this helps to really simplify uh, the building of 3D solid terrain models. Uh, we've also completely updated uh, our match view tool, uh, so we can match our model with the background photograph and have the shadows and reflections traced into the, into the, the background there. Okay. Now, Form Z also includes 3D dimensions to help annotate your model. Uh, these can be associated to your objects if desired. Uh, so if you attach your dimension to a point or segment of any object and reshape the object, the dimension will automatically update. Uh, now, there's also a new Curve to Arcs tool, which can convert any spline curve into a series of continuous arcs. So if you're not going to CNC machining and you want to create a construction document with a series of arcs, it's a great tool for that. Um, and also there's an Unfold tool. Uh, and I think you guessed it, that you unfold your objects. Now you can see here that I had some fun building a simple roof with the roof tool, unfolding it, printing it out on a printer here at the office, then I use some scissors and tape to reconstruct my own little rapid prototyping model. Uh, now speaking of true rapid prototyping, ForMZ is a perfect fit for the 3D printing process uh, since it is a true 3D solids modeler. And there's also numerous other tools in ForMZ uh, to assist you in making sure that your model prints right the first time. So there's a print prep tool, an object doctor, and a thicken tool uh, to make sure that uh, everything's set to go. Um, now we didn't have time to show any animation features on today, uh, but I would like to mention that you can animate objects. So they'll, you can animate materials, lights, cameras, just about anything that you want. From the, now it should be mentioned that I'm playing this animation on my machine in real time. Now, however, on your machine, you might not see it playing back in real time because you know this is a live webinar broadcast that's based on your internet connection. Okay, but um, as you can see, you can animate cameras as we walk down our station. Uh, we can animate objects uh, such as having the doors open and close. Uh, you can animate lights, materials, uh, just about anything you want. And of course, everything you see here uh, for this project was modeled, rendered, and animated uh, completely in Forms E7. All right, and if we don't have the tool or feature that you need, just create your own using the Forms of the SDK scripting. All right, and that concludes my presentation for the day. Again, I would like to thank uh, Frank and Vince and Kevin and all the, all the wonderful people there at NoVeg for hosting us and letting us uh, show you just a few of the many wonderful features in Forms E7. So at this point, I'd like to hand it back to Frank and make it back to Kevin. So thanks again. Hey, Matt, that was awesome. Uh, that was really, really comprehensive and. I have a question from Derry. Um, I guess uh, here starts our Q&A session. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So Derry has a question. Um, how can I present a project in the layout with plan section, perspective, render, etc., in the same sheet? Please. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will show. Awesome. Um, here's here's how the process works in Forms 7 um, If you want to start a brand new layout. Uh, what you do is you choose the in the file pull down file new layout project okay and that sets up this new layout dialog where you can set your uh, paper size so all the industry standard paper sizes here and we're going to be adding uh, title blocks and things like that so there actually some additional features are coming up here too but um, this pretty much gets you started and it opens up a brand new project. Now this is your layout project. Uh, this is separate from any other Formz file. When you save a 3D model, it's a Formz file. If you save a layout, it's a FML file. It's a completely different project. Okay. Uh, if you want to add additional sheets, uh, you can see that there is a sheets palette. So we go down here. Uh, we'll look at the sheets palette here. And there's one sheet. I click plus and adds a, adds a second sheet. Click plus, it adds a third sheet. Uh, so if I zoom out a little bit, you can see I'm adding more sheets, and I can just you know put stuff anywhere that I want in these sheets. If you want to reorder the sheets, let's say I want this one uh, to be on top of that one, so on and so forth, you can just drag and drop the sheets in any order. Now the question is, you know, how do we get stuff into these sheets? Okay, well if you, if you go into this one here, uh, all the tools for doing that is located right here. Uh, if we create a frame. Um, Let's go ahead and uh, just place a, a frame here like that, okay? And now it says, okay, what do you want to put inside of that frame? Uh, so I can open up a file here, and I tell you what, um, let's see if I can find something here we can use. Get a real-world project here. 
how about this uh, bench right here? Let's see if that, okay. Now, with that bench, um, you can see that uh, you can define the parameters. Um, you can have a top view, front view, side, side view. You can also do an actual floor plan where it'll cut through the actual model. Actually, I probably should show that next. Uh, but here, since we just have a 3D object there, let's do a, let's, let's do a front view. Okay, uh, we can, you can turn layers on and off. If you have clipping planes, you can turn those on for cross-section views, so on and so forth. You give it a scale. Um, this is sort of big, so I'm going to boost the scale up just a bit here. And that's it. Just set everything you want. You click OK, uh, and then it, it, it brings it in, and there it is. So there's our view there. Um, if we want to bring in an actual image, uh, we choose the image option. Uh, you can see in our tool options over here, uh, we can load any image that we want. Let's see what I can find here. Do I have any pictures of the bench? There it is, bench. There it is. All right, and that's that's pretty small. So let's give it a different size here. Let's change the height of that thing to a different size. Make it and so forth, and place that in there. Okay. Um, and just keep adding more, more, and more frames. Um, let's go to another sheet here, and let's sort of make, make this even faster. Uh, there's a multi-frame option here. So we can actually take you know multiple views in at the, at the same time. So let's try this. Um, let's load a different file. Let's see what I can find here. How about more of an architectural project, maybe some kind of building or something? So we can do some floor plans with that. Um, Let's try this one. Um, okay. Open up that one. All right. So this this is floor plan, top, left, right. This is already set up for me. I didn't do anything. But if you want to change that, you can. You can change your layout, you know, to be some other layout. Uh, change your scales and all that stuff. Um, notice in this view, uh, this is top. Uh, this is a this is a, a floor plan, and we're going to say cut it at forty eight at forty eight inches. Okay, so we can give it a certain height. Say, well, you know, let's do the floor plan. If you're looking up at it from you know, a certain distance, whatever, so on and so forth. Um, the scale, I got a quarter inch per foot. I don't know how that's going to turn out here. It might be big or small, whatever. But I think we get the point. Let's just click OK. And you can see that it'll, then it'll bring that information in, uh, both a uh, both an actual floor plan, which is here. Uh, we have uh, the top view here. Uh, we have you know, front side view, so on and so forth. So. That's how you bring multiple views in at the same time. At this point, you know, once we have this stuff in here, you do have access to all the tools for creating text. You can put some dimensions on there. Uh, you can put hatch patterns, um, just about everything you need. So that's basically, in a nutshell, how the, how the actual um, layout works. Now, when you save your project, uh, it is saving it as a completely separate FML file. Um, now, if you open this file up later, if you go back to this project and change that 3D model file, it will automatically update back here. Um, and, okay, so I think that's pretty much everything with the actual layout. So hopefully that answered that question. If not, send it back in and I'll try I to think, it. Cool, dude. Um, Matt, I think that was awesome. Uh, I'm going to change the presenter back to me now. Uh, let's see. All right. All right, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Matthew, uh, for coming out here, taking time out of your busy schedule to help us out and uh, just co-host this uh, webinar with us. And from the guys at Novich, I will thank you for co-hosting this. And um, if you guys are looking for more tutorials and how-tos, please check out Matt's website at matthewhowinski.com. Uh, now, folks, if you want to learn more about Form Z7's award-winning capabilities and features, feel free to head on over to Autodesk's website at www.formz.com. Here you can find information about the products, get support, there's a forum, and there's also a gallery to see what kind of de um, designs that you can make with Form Z. Now, if you want to purchase a copy or to check out uh, a trial version, visit our website at noveg.com. Uh, as the leading online design software superstore, we pretty much have the best prices around. So if Form Z7 is your ideal general solid and surface modeler, uh, call or chat with us anytime. For any and all information about Form Z7, speak with our specialist Bob Bayer at bob at noveg.com. Here at Noveg, we have created several communities to foster collaboration and communication between design professionals. At rhinojungle.com, you have access to all the latest industry news and videos. Furthermore, we encourage our community members to help each other excel in their careers 
through discussion and submitted content. It is free and the process to sign up is easy. On top of that, a short weekly newsletter with the latest buzz are yours to enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to email me at kevin at noveg.com. Um, in our upcoming webinar, episode 56, Going from Sketch to Model, Gabriel Matthews will show you the basics of taking an idea and creating it in 3D. Webinar attendees will learn how to, a simple sketch of a lamp can be easily transformed into a model that can be then sent to engineers for manufacturing. Different iterations will be shown by using the Rhino 4.0 history option. Uh, registration is free, but space is limited, so for more information on how to sign up, check it out at novich.com forward slash webinar forward slash 56. And if you want to rewatch episode 55 and all our previous webinars, this and past webinars are, can be found on our NoVeg webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube, so stay tuned. On behalf of our team at NoVeg, thank you guys for watching. Adios.